Guten Abend allerseits. Good evening. I'm very happy that so many of you have come. And as uh, usual, we had many more people who wanted to attend. And uh, and uh, well, and we have managed to get fit everybody in. And uh, so obviously, um, the weather is a reason for having made it possible for us uh, to fit all of you in. Too cold is not good enough, too hot is not good enough. And now, uh, today, we have perfect weather, which means that we have a right, the right size of audience here. Um, well, the lecture series has been going on for some time, and uh, it has always been booked up. And I can only say that not every city manages to get the hall so filled up as we as we have done. And this, I think, is typical of Berlin that it makes makes it possible for us to mobilize so many pe people. The this series of lectures started at the end of 2017 with a um, presentation by Manuel Castells. Since then, the Federal Agency for Civic Education and the Alexander Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society society uh, have uh, been inviting s um, six or seven European uh, um, scholars and uh, lecturers uh, to um, present us their view on the developments of digital society. For the second time this year, we have um, chosen the How, this theater, as our venue, which is a very special place where criticism of society uh, has always been an important topic here and where we have been able to gain a new audience. Um, Dick Becker is our speaker tonight, one of the most uh, well-known sociologists in Germany, and so far he has been one of the few um, um, people in his uh, realm of uh, science who uh, is not only interested in digitization, uh, but uh, who has also dealt with the importance of digital media for, soci for our society. Toby Müller will be our moderator, and he will say a few works, uh, words of introduction, and he will also lead us through the discussion afterwards. And He'll also have a little discussion with Dirk Becker uh, following the lecture. So I would like to wish you a stimulating and interesting evening. Well, thank you very much to Janet Hoffman for these introductory remarks. So before I want to introduce the speaker, I want to say a few words on uh, the organization of tonight. We will have the lecture first, then we will have a 25 uh, minutes of a discussion between me and Dirk Becker. And afterwards, you uh, it's your turn. There are microphones distributed uh, uh, around uh, the uh, audience uh, room here. And you can also Twitter um, uh, some comments or questions. Uh, Alex TV, uh, you can watch us on Alex TV. There's also th this uh, whole lecture will also be streamed on the website of the Humboldt Institute and also the Federal Agency for Civic education, they also stream this event because they have been organizing this together. And there will be also a podcast in the next few days, um, not of this uh, uh, evening here, but this will be a separate uh, discussion um, um, mit, with Dirk Becker. So in the mid-90s and in our culture of uh, uh, remembrance uh, on retrofuturistic phenomena like techno music or the spread of email, much of the established uh, artists see and the cultural media elite was still under the strong influence of the um, post-68 era uh, of personal fulfillment or criticism of capitalism, which um, fo focused less on Marx but on uh, saying no. Well, I'm saying this because a book like the post-heroic management, so here you can see it, uh, this book was published by our guest uh, in 1994, and this was perceived by the theater people at that time as something really strange, but also as something fascinating. What management, organization, control, communication? Well, those was, were used to be words of people in office blocks and uh, suits. N not all in the cultural sector knew immediately uh, that uh, um, some um, uh, knew anything about systems theory at that time. Only some playwrights. The systems theory, which is um, 
not only associate, not is associated in particular with Niklas Luhmann. Luhmann, this is a super theory in the sense of a theory uh, um, superordinate, uh, total and open with regard to the result. And it is a very sober theory. The system the theory did not allow itself to be abused for fights. Uh, um, um, Luhmann um, wrote his PhD in habilitation thesis, thesis under Mr. Under Prof. Professor Lu Luhmann, and uh, he, after po the post heroic management, his most recent book is 4.0 or the gap that the computer leaves behind. And he says that the theory must not be more conclusive, must not appear more conclusive than society to which it applies. He studied in Stanford at the John Hopkins University and at the London School of Economics. In 1996, he went to the University of Wittenherdecke in the Ruhr area and uh, became and got a professorship for management business ethics and social change. About 10 years later, he taught cultural theory at the Zeppelin University in Friedrichshafen. And since 2015, he has been back to Wittenherberg, and now he is dean for the faculty of cultural reflection and also a professor for cultural theory and management. He's also a co-editor of the magazine Social Systems, a magazine for social theory. His list of publication is very long. He publishes with Zurkamp or Merve or other uh, academic uh, editing houses. But what is important for us tonight is is that our uh, guest uh, um, um, th thinks in a way that transcends the dis different disciplines. Uh, he al always remains very demanding as a um, scientist, although he publishes in mainstream media. And uh, he demands a lot of the reader, but uh, however not being able to understand is also part of what he calls intelligence. And uh, maybe um, another word uh, by uh, by way of introduction, which school of thought do you feel attracted to when it comes to digital transformation, more to the apocalyptic uh, view who see our culture doomed, or uh, do you take a more euphoric view, uh, or uh, are you a more a moderate person who believes that everything can exist uh, next, uh, next to each other, like streaming platforms as well, or do you belong to those who sway back and forth between all these different poles. Well, our guest tonight does not regard these poles as dialectic positions that he wants to lead to a resolution. He, I think, is a master of conjunction. End is probably the word which best characterizes his thinking. So now I would like to pass on the floor to him. A warm welcome to Dirk Becker. Well, thank you very much for these very friendly words of welcome and uh, for the invitation to talk to you here. So we sociologists, we theatre people have already uh, gone through a lot of uh, ups and downs with, your, with this topic and also with uh, your um, 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 with the Humboldt uh, Society here, and uh, um, I'm very gra grateful that I have this uh, rostrum here, so that uh, unlike with the TED Talks, I don't have to g walk back and forth and from right to left on this stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have a plan for tonight, and I would like to present you some phenomena, and I hope that they will be clear and illustrative to you. Um, with regard to the um, patterns with which sociologists at the moment think about digitization and about what we call the next generation. And I have to also talk about the resources that we have because for the last 10 to 15 years we have had a debate on these digitization phenomena of all different kinds. Um, so we had uh, apocalyptic views, um, critical views, uh, visionary views, and discussions with regard to the digitize to digitization or the digital from transformation. I don't want to repeat what we are all familiar with already. So I have four to five points, um, first of all on the issue, then also on the theory resources and then on the issue as to how we want to um, define um, um, 
the whole area, then maybe also some questions, and last but not least, maybe some kind of well, irritation. In the 90s, as system theorists, we were always very keen on, uh, with regard to the students that we, and our clients that we dealt with, to, to irritate them with our systems theory, or well, that is something that we no longer do. Uh, what is more important now is to um, come up and develop a um, common working position, despite uh, the funny things that we come across, we need a sober and serious discussion on that. The well, next generation, that is a slogan by Peter Drucker, he invented that, and this um, means that currently we are in a kind of fourth media era that is well known, I think, this is, I'm saying this only by way of introduction, a fourth media era, uh, Marshall McLuhan, Mich Michel Sayer, and Others have proclaimed that they refer to that as a kind in, in a kind of standard way, in order to offer some kind of heuristics, which uh, will make it uh, possible to deal with the uh, nervous um, um, atmosphere uh, and the. Um, in, um, the, the first media era was the introduction of oral language uh, about 5,000 years ago. The second era was uh, the introduction of a written language, uh, alphabet, the alphabet, about uh, three to 5,000 uh, years ago. Then the printing, modern printing, this was uh, the, the beginning of the modern era, um, namely a society that became more and more literate and more and more people learned how to read and write. This uh, brought a lot of momentum to social development uh, ever since, and uh, maybe something that we still underestimate, the range of, uh, and, and the reach of um, this development, uh, that, uh, um, and this le also made it possible for people to, 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 um, to ex and develop criticism. People were able to read and form their own opinion on the basis of what they read and then were able to criticize developments. So this uh, came about 500 years ago. And what is important is that now with the introduction of electronic media, radio, cinema, TV, uh, all the way up to, the com to computers and AI, we uh, now, uh, well, are uh, the beginning of only the fourth media era, and uh, the assumption of cultural and uh, media academics is that uh, um, well, they they have developed their um, well, we be benefit from these uh, three previous uh, um, media era. So uh, we indeed do not know what is happening at the moment, although this is happening to us. Um, we, after all, digit digitalize our Ourselves, so society digitalizes itself, and we digit and the society and society di digitizes people. So we are the um, actors and the victims, so to say, and we can learn from uh, from the past uh, how how people dealt and uh, uh, and handled uh, language, written language, and the printing um, era. Niklas Luhmann said, with every new media of communication, new new possibilities of action, of experience, of communication, of making sense of society, of uh, individuality, of everything that is so important for human life comes, comes about, and uh, things um, which the previous uh, media era was not prepared for. So um, this is the principle of uh, that with every era, things become more complex, uh, growing complex complexity um, and um, then we have to deal with the question as to how the communication is distributed namely the possibility that others in the same society are able to live and uh, be successful with these media and with this new media and um, 
How is it possible to develop to uh, a cultural idea of um, what making sense within a society? And what I have done and what some, uh, some others have done, uh, um, is, uh, we, we had a look at the structural forms and the cultural forms of these fear media era in a, um, in a, um, in, in a systematic way. So um, some uh, um, cultural scientists are not very happy uh, um, when we try to distinguish, uh, di di try to separate and um, uh, describe uh, the development of uh, humankind with these four media eras. And, um, the, um, but so, um, so this is the fourth media era, and there are two consequences from that that are important for us uh, tonight, uh, consequences for sociology and consequences for the current AI discussion. And in particular, the consequences for the current AI discussion are those that have prompted me to say that uh, sociology should not only uh, um, um, follow the developments uh, and um, uh, deal with them in the aftermath, uh, but that uh, that sociology, with its research on social intelligence, should play an active role in this uh, debate on intelligence. Uh, so what are the consequences for sociology? Uh, well, afterwards, we could have a more in-depth discussion on that. Well, basically, these are dramatic consequences for us sociologists, and we could uh, uh, have a whole lecture on that. There are two consequences. Um, this has to do with the kind of structure of our society and what kind of culture will we have in our society. In sociology, from Max Weber to Niklas Luhmann, we are um, used to uh, this idea of a functional differentiation within our society. So um, a rationale of um, love and a rationale of um, education and art, for example. So. Um, and uh, the hope is that, uh, that all these differentiated segments of society will aggregate into a meaningful whole or become integrated into a meaningful whole, which is then uh, society. So a functional differentiation, which um, basically is based on a division of labor and an, an interplay interaction of highly dynamic uh, individual and different systems. The assumption, um, which is often expressed in cultural um, um, sciences and media sciences and also in some social sciences, is that through this uh, functional differentiation, like the division of labor, uh, and through an aggregation or integration um, based on reason, um, that with this model, it is no longer possible to understand our society. In the last 150 years, uh, we had often very irrational phenomena again and again, but uh, they have not prevented us from believing in a reasonable way, in the, in the possibility to reasonably shape society. And, uh, and um, so with the Third Reich, we, 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 that uh, reason has an, um, is not um, not a possibility, but we got out of this um, um, cul-de-sac, so to say. And currently, the discussion is that uh, reason or rash, uh, rational thinking is not a, an integration concept. But now that we have are faced with a new form of structures of our society, which uh, uh, are more idiosyncratic, more uh, rational, more exclusive when it comes uh, to uh, the people who are 
who have the possibility to be part uh, of that. And uh, similar to what Manuel Castells said, that the um, functional differentiation is uh, replaced by a network society. There are long debates uh, about what we can understand by this network society, also by Manuel Castells. Um, and uh, uh, so if we have a look at the networks uh, of our society, um, um, the ma most the, the um, really interesting thing about a network is that it is highly selective and highly exclusive. A network is always determined by the fact that some people or organizations, places or stories are part of the network and others are excluded. And um, this could be a dramatic uh, difference to modern society society of because uh, these mentioned uh, functional different the, the, the systems based on um, functional differentiation at least based on the principles of the French Revolution equality fraternity et liberté means that everybody is supposed to be able to take part in everything in government in school in education and everybody should be able to take part in the arts and should be able to understand that and be able to go to a theater and understand theater plays or be able to do art themselves. So this inclusiveness of modern era, we have all grown up with that. And this is now replaced by this concept of a network society which still has not any has not developed any norms for that but the structures are already there and the cultural idea that everything will aggregate in a rational way and that is what i will dwell on from now on this uh, will be or is being replaced by the idea that there is no longer a culture of reason but a culture of complexity. I think we all have heard of that. I think we all have some feeling of what this could mean. And everybody who is somewhat informed about that uh, always hopes that there won't be, that uh, we won't mention the definition of that because there are 12 different definitions of this complexity, like algorithmic complexity, mathematical complexity, and so on. And I will give you more details later on, because um, this uh, 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 brings me to the question regarding the intelligences that we are surrounded by. So the consequences of the current uh, AI discussion result from that. And for the past 40, 50 years, we there has been little public awareness for us, and when I say us, I mean industrial movements around the world. When it comes to autom uh, the automation, so everything, anything that can dis be described in technical terms, from human to technical pr processes, to automate that by using the media so that machines can do it autonomously. This is no longer the top, the current topic of attention. So this much heralded buzzword of Industry 4.0 basically lives on the idea that there's again an autonomy and not only automation. Again, an autonomy is a decisive step in the attempt to enable machines to have at least as much autonomy as human, the, the human functioning system. And markets over the past 300, 400 years have learned a lot, so for machines to learn as much. What does that mean? That means that when we're surrounded by machines, autonomy, means the decision to deal with the surround with their surroundings as humans have learned so what does that mean in terms of intelligence well i'll get back to that in a minute but it's interesting because this gain in autonomy shows that the title of my talk here is very much insufficient digitalization and the next society. Well, it's really about automation too, for example, and this is the major challenge of AI and of the integration of AI in day-to-day -day activities and processes that help us in everyday life. 
but also industry um, institutionalized processes, research, science, religion, art. So in all these areas, we are confronted with that task to combine digital computers. Digital computers are computers that can be programmed using code to do what we want them to do in such to such an extent that we can no longer grasp those processes. And analogous computers are computers that are not part of this medium if when, so the calculability of processes. But rather what Paul Watzlawick said about communication, they are in the medium of contradiction. So they shape their own processes, continuous function is what we're talking about then. They are aware of their boundaries and borders with their surroundings and are thus not aimed at binary structures but contradictory structures. Combining this with social science again, from my point of view, it means that we are called upon, I think, to take this concept of negativity of human beings, machines, cultural institutions, technical processes. So to develop such a complex, uh, such a concept of negativity, so that binarity, binary, the binary character and generalized contradictions that don't tell us what we are turning against. So combining these two elements would be the next challenge. Saying, for example, I do not want to have any water right now, which I admit is not the truth in this very moment. But that would mean that I leave open the question, so what do I want to drink instead? It's a generalizing or general negation that opens up a whole range of possibilities. But if instead I say, and I can't think of an example for the other form of negation now, and I really can't think of anything now. So contrasting zero and one, male and female, yes and no, that is a direct negation which opens up room for contradiction, tension, possibly a story. How can we combine yes and no, men and women, upstairs and downstairs, etc. But I continue to focus on this one contradiction that I have developed. So, But instead, if I say I don't want to drink any water, then I leave open what I want to drink instead. George Master Brown, my favorite mathematician, developed this concept of general negation. And we'll see in a minute why we need that and in which way. Second point, what does it mean? Theoretical resources, well, there are very few, I'd like to mention, but digitalization, analogization, I don't want to talk about that a lot, but society describes both as medial and complex form. Jacques Derrida coined this term difference in a talk in 1961 during a presentation, and it's supposed to refer to a phenomenon that is not predictable in terms of how we are able to deal with it. And Derrida called this, uh, said, talked about being it being iterable, like a virus, so repeatable, without, but without limiting its own dynamic development, it can't survive. So this medial form is a form which on the one side 
So how, how can we describe this best? It assumes an unpredictable form, for example, a sentence, a phrase being expressed by means of words. I can combine the words in different ways, use more or fewer words. I can invite people to use very different words. You are listening to me formulating a sentence, and you're probably thinking, well, he could have formulated it more precisely. He could have used less sociolog um, sociolo sociological terminology. And while I'm telling you about this definition, you I part of thinking about this medium. So you are basically surpassing the medium that I'm using, looking at this space of opportunities. So that is what a medium is about. Another example, you get to know somebody, you fall in love. And if you're very unlucky, you'll have a sociologist tell you that it's your medium to move inside love. So a declaration of love would be a form of communication in this medium. And if he, your declaration of love fails, or maybe not, then this is a room of opportunity. So it can be a, an ironic declaration of love, a timid declaration of love. So there are lots of possibilities that will shape what you will experience. But you have to make that choice first. So I am inviting you to see digitalization as a medial form, so as a room of possibilities where we have loads of possibilities of which only a few have been realized so far. And this should not shock you or deter you, but it should invite you to have a closer look at all the possibilities that have not, have not been explored yet. Medial form is a complex form. So this brings me to the definition of complexity. The easiest or simplest definition, the sense of European classicism, is um, unity in diversity, as is the motto of the European Union. The most beautiful example, for, however, is complex numbers in mathematics, where we have several um, solutions for one equation, pl plus one, minus one, are both the root of one, which gives you a two-side complexity. Uh, differentiating between men and women is also complexity, because despite all the gender debates, you can't reduce men to women or and vice versa. But in the variabilization of scope for behavior, we try to do just that. And we can only tr attempt this here, and here I don't want to talk about biological aspects or whatever, but about cultural aspects, because there's still something that differentiates men and women. So unity and diversity, two sides of formulation, two things that cannot be reduced to the other. And the next aspect is describing digitalization and society as complex forms. So talking about them as scope of possibilities, of used and unused possibilities on the one side, and on the other side, complexity that is being defined in terms of content as the encounter or the combination of what we can't control, system references, four to five. Situation like this one, I'm giving a talk, you're listening to me, later we'll have a discussion. It's a complex form in the sense that we need a language to talk to each other, a common language. We need simultaneous interpretation. And I'm probably going way too fast for the interpreters already now, sorry. And, as sociologists say, fluid systems of uh, consciousness, which you all have coming here.
And it's not the case for all talks because there are some presentations that you can give in an automated way, even if not autonomously. So on the one side, we have this thinking with the um, speaker, but on the other hand, it's completely impossible to say a sentence or understand a sentence without these two aspects, communication and consciousness, not being part of the equation. And that is the general situation of the human form, complexity of thinking and speaking. This saves us a lot of trouble because we can say one thing and mean the other and vice versa. Sometimes both concur. That has a lot to do with our hope for rationality. But right now it's more about differences between the two. And the crux is when we talk about digitalization and society as complex form is that Further uh, additional systems references are added to the equation, possibly among them the organism. So in the moment where somebody takes their smartphone out of their pocket, then we have at least four or five system references. The technical reference, how does the smartphone work, the organic systems reference, how will I be using my fingers and adolescents are much smarter with that. I keep holding my smartphone with the, in the right hand and use just one finger of my left hand to write on my smartphone. So even people only 10 years younger, they open it and use it with their right hand typing at the same time. I can't do that. I know that I'm my behavior is ancient behavior, but it's my physical adaptation to this smartphone. At the same time, I try to keep up because my neural structures are well adapted. I can keep up with the changing images on the screen. So your body has to function, your consciousness. I need to be able to understand to a certain degree what I'm looking at. Society as the always limited sum of offers of communication and uh, this brings me to a total number of four systems. Cultural habits can also be added to this equation. So I have four to five systems references that cannot be reduced to one another, but in every concrete act of using such a device, and please don't only think of smartphones now, but also think of Bloomberg terminals of uh, st stockbrokers, uh, think of a soldier's equipment, think of nuclear uh, physics, the internet, highly complex programs used by nuclear physics to analyze and evaluate data. Think of hospitals where monitors are being used and I sat by side with patient, the patient's bed and both the doctor and the patient look at those monitors to deduce some form of treatment or therapy. So far the authority of the physician ha had been the dominant factor in this equation. So think of professional contexts where monitors, software programs are being used. And I think it is worthwhile, and I encourage you to do so, to just use those four to five references and look at, okay, why is this working in this context and how? Secondly, it's also worthwhile because our observation in sociology is that at the physical organic level, we are much smarter and much more able to learn than on the mental level. So we can all work our smartphones, mailboxes, etc. physically while we don't know what it does to us mentally. So we are using media and we're in already part of those media and we know that the necessity of us to use them 
um, is nothing that we understand, but our the ability of our, our fingers to use it is already there 100 percent. So there's a practical ability. And in the international context, intercultural context, when it comes to the difficulties in introducing new devices, here it's interesting that we are able to say linking practical physical capabilities at the physical level with societal aspects, attractiveness can become more functional, more violent even than what the consciousness can imagine. And consciousness, we might see this as an advantage, is hesitant and tries to understand what happened before. It's not thinking first, taking action then. It's taking action first and then attempting to think. And in many cases, the thinking process will not take place at all. The main point in this description is that we don't count to one. Computer scientists do that, they just count te um, technical systems, sociologists only count society. I say we need to count to four or five to combine those different systems references, not only in that general building of um, sociologist, sociological super theory, but in general aspects. And what I just gave you as an example about negativity and negation, what I tried to describe there, can be reduced to the fact that the digital and analog medium that I'm using, I can only understand those, if I am aware of the potential for negativity of all those four systems references. I don't have to check my mails, I don't have to use Twitter, my, I can say no to all of that, my body can say no to all of that, can be overwhelmed, can be overly nervous, stressed out, I can fall ill, I can become addicted, then there's there can be this inner revolt and then there can be legal institutions, the European Union among others, who say no to certain forms of networks and computer scientists keep saying no too because they're developing some things but not others. They try to promote what they have developed and are not talking about what they haven't developed yet. So there's a continuous flow of negation saying no system references refer to one another and compared to them the very few things that happen in this room of possibilities. So I do encourage everyone to get away from the phenomenization of society, do not can get confused by that, but really have a look at the products that have come to the market and that we are using. So to give you a summary, what does that mean for digitization and the next society? And then this brings me to the third point. Then I have to break down digital uh, digitization to something which I could then co in specific terms um, subject to my analysis. And uh, the same holds true for the next society, um, the overall structure, communication culture, and so on. Break this down to something that I can then monitor, watch, analyze. And for tonight, I can say that well, it's nice that Many uh, pieces of work have uh, uh, been done in the field of sociology that uh, have highlighted this. And as a result of that, I would say that digitization has to do in particular with a complex form of data. 
Yeah. Data and uh, is basically the concrete or the specific form, the materialization of digitization data that uh, are produced, that are processed, that uh, one side um, wants to own, uh, the other side produces data that is passed on from the right place to the wrong place. And, from, and so let us look at data when we want to talk about digitization. Why is data so interesting? Well, because they... Uh, have a form. They include something, uh, and uh, you can look at where data is compiled, where it is produced, and this leads to some kind of uh, predictability. And and data also excludes a lot. Every data says something about something, and doesn't say anything about other things. And so, this is a very simple uh, uh, assumption, uh, and therefore my request is let us uh, focus on data because they include and uh, some certain things and exclude other things and this uh, they contain this kind of negativity let us look at data on the under the heading of uh, predictability always also looking at what wouldn't make data unpredictable uh, one of the thinkers of the MIT in Cambridge, Alex Pendlein, said that uh, the most intelligent algorithms that make it possible f to predict behavior used by Amazon, for example, they have a hit rate uh, with regard to the behavior that they predict of about 60%, so 40% is not un not predictable. So would that be our scope of freedom? Well, yes. But uh, we have an even greater scope of freedom where no data is collected and there, where therefore no predictability is produced. And what kind of um, possibilities for manipulation do data offer and where don't they offer any room for manipulation? So with regard to um, data that can be used on stock exchange markets for investment decisions and where are these data not used? So these are the questions that we have to direct at uh, data, which data does exist and um, which data is not compiled. So um, the media form and the form of the next generation, that is, uh, in regards to the in regards to the question what kind of uh, quest, what kind of action what kind of experience is made possible by which kind of network so what is possible in a kind of startup scene in berlin in terms of action and in terms of experience with regard to how society is understood and how uh, um, society can be part of a project or not be part of a project, a project that could go into this direction or a project into, that could go into another direction. So that is my fav the favorite question of a sociologist, how uh, are uh, opportunities for activity coupled back to who experiences what in a kind of community, be it a church or a startup or university uh, or some other form of community. So the question namely as to how things are distributed, to what extent are opportunities uh, for ex making experience uh, or having experience uh, how, to what extent is, is that distributed across a society? So we can uh, put this question also to, for example, the Federal Agency for Civic Education. How can we expand and, and extend opportunities uh, for experience uh, across our society? I mean, not, not, not only focus on who does what, but also uh, on who experiences what, and, uh, and therefore, um, uh, uh, this has to do uh, with the possibility to convince such persons uh, with certain experience uh, with regard to um, expect what kind of action they will take, what kind of positions they will have, and uh, so on. And uh, so we live in a very complex society. Uh, um, um, and uh, in a complex society, we talked about
about functional differentiation and uh, um, so networks uh, offer different kinds of um, possibilities and opportunities for taking action and for having certain experiences and therefore our society is even more complex now than before and these two phenomena the phenomenon of data and the phenomenon of um, possibilities for action and experience um, this is uh, brought uh, this comes together in the following point and and um, that is something that I consider important when we, when we talk about intelligence and inte research into intelligence namely the observation that with regard to all the phenomena that we can observe and that I just sketched out that there is a synchronization of these system references uh, as they refer to data as we refer to life and so on, that all this is already taking place. I mean, sociologists uh, like to describe that everything that is ha happening, as Niklas Luhmann said, everything that is happening is unlikely. So the question is why. So obviously, um, certain thresholds of unlikeliness are overcome. And uh, so, uh, professors, for example, who believe that they uh, are able to teach students something like theory, or politicians uh, who stand for election, obviously, these things exist. And I uh, don't want to refer to our Minister of Economic Affairs, uh, and that uh, there's still the belief that we have something like national champions, things like that. And you may ask, well, haven't they understood? Uh, no, and the, it's the other the other way around. We say that there is a synchronization of these four to five different system references regarding the data that we have, and d referring to uh, our own experience, um, that this actually takes place. So now we can have a look at uh, how physical irritability, so uh, an organism has been described as an irritable media or m a means of or structures of uh, life uh, um, that has uh, neural, neural activities, then also a contingency of society uh, and the non-triviality of technology, uh, that all this comes together. So incommensurable um, uh, systems, uh, system references come together and are synchronized in something that is then successful. Although so all these systems, all these system references have their own momentum, their own idea of time, their own time horizon, their own fears, their own possibilities. So this is really astonishing when we consider all that. And uh, this is where sociology, sociological research starts. So there are lots of examples in literature for that. I don't want to overstretch your patience here. Um, there's one example that I think is particularly fascinating. So if you have a look at art, for example, if, if we take pictures, so a picture, if uh, you see that in the digitization media that uh, we have in front of us that we couldn't live with them without any pictures, and in Basel certain uh, scientific criteria have been developed with regard to images or pictures uh, and and when we uh, come back to the synchronization question, if you take it seriously, then we have to look at uh, pictures in a different way as we did with regard to modern art. So pictures uh, with the language of Immanuel Kant, where today we would say, well, with beauty and uh, uh, it's not a criteria that is sufficient for art and it is a criteria that is not sufficient at all for technical images. So, um, the, um, so these uh, Im images or pictures uh, um, make it possible to um, to, to understand what is visible and what uh, not what is not visible in these pictures, like Karen Byrne. So from the semiotic level, we move back to the material level, and we we um, 
have certain cuts in this uh, in these pictures that um, make it possible for us to be fascinated by this picture and that uh, and that call up uh, social norms uh, and then uh, from this material level we move back to the semiotic level and uh, and um, and this materialization could be um, referred to for lots of other examples like protest movement, movements or agility in the city and things like that. And uh, well, here I want to basically stop here and uh, want to come back to um, irritation, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, a simple thing that you're all familiar with and that, um, uh, a question that is pretty simple but you're familiar with. The more artificial intelligence moves away from the hermeneutic human intelligence, that is this human intelligence of which we've always believed that it has to do with the depth of understanding, with um, coming up with a meaning, with a, with a sense um, that um, we managed to deal with ambiguity and, uh, and, and and so on, on which we now also know that we have to, there, to break that down into uh, neuro, neural, uh, organic, uh, social, and other forms of intelligence because we don't have, do not only have this one intelligence. So the more AI moves away from the human hermeneutic intelligence and uh, machine learning basically has to do with statistics, this, so this basically has to do with statistics, and you're probably more um, familiar with that than me. And, uh, and so the more uh, AI moves away uh, from uh, hermeneutic uh, human intelligence to statistical compilation, um, the more become we more the more we move away from the question as to whether AI will replace uh, human intelligence because that is no longer the the question, and the more we will uh, develop and detect the statistical characteristics of this human intelligence. So uh, what we understand or describe as learning, and that is currently uh, one of the hot topics, um, uh, that is, let me try to understand this human way of thinking at a mental level. So namely that uh, with our uh, superb uh, um, intellectual achievements like reading the books by Kant or reading the book by Niklas Luhmann or um, similar books and so when we do all this intellectual work, we uh, only work on the statistical coping of uh, our own coping with it. Do I understand this book? Do I understand this book in this context? What do I have to do in order to understand this book? So we use theorems in order to be able to uh, predict um, with what we are confronted with. So this is basically a statistical uh, uh, work and it is a st statistical effort that we make and maybe all this is statistical intelligence and not more. So irritation, so we uh, observe, we watch a machine learning um, uh, under the headings of creativity um, and see that this has nothing to do with creativity. We look back at the human being and uh, find out that well, we have nothing to do with that either, with creativity or individuality. So in most cases, if we are able to understand a book like that, it's only uh, the result of our learning, of our statistical effort. So the, uh, we have a, the irreducible complexity and and we try to attack that uh, with uh, statistics, with predictability theory, and uh, and uh, look at correlations and no longer at causality. So the systems that we want to describe uh, expect their own um, dismantling. The networks that we deal with are networks that expect their own unreliability in order to be able to cope with the environment. So and these systems and these uh, networks um, give us this unpredictability that uh, allow us to be humans.
Thank you very much, Dick Becker, for this presentation. I'll now try to do two different things. One is link up to or follow on from the things that I did not understand. So what I heard during your talk and understood only partly, maybe we can go into more detail there. We'll have 20 to 25 minutes, I think, before you in the audience can ask your questions and formulate your comments. So irritation is what you talked about at the end of your presentation. Before, I want to take a step back. So you said there's this co-evolution of machine um, artificial intelligence and human intelligence or intelligences that you split into four or five different forms of intelligence means that we g gain a new understanding of intelligence and innovation, creativity uh, are no longer happening as part of human intelligences as you've described them. So the question is, this means that we ig ignore creativity, innovation, that we no longer need them or do they just appear in a different form or at a different point in, in artificial intelligence, will we no longer have to be innovative and creative? Well, no, not at all. We are still dealing with these two things, whether it's the ideas of a genius intuition, it's a leading capability or skill when we talk to, to artists. So a good playwright, drama playwright has seen dozens of plays and co-produced dozens of plays and basically calculates the probability to be successful with something new, innovative. We talk about this as creative work, but it's basically just predicting something new. So I said statistics. Well, when I use this term statistics, it sounds mechanical, almost lifeless. But statistics really is nothing else but the capability to to basically compare what we know and what we don't know. So to have this overall room of possibilities, compare that with the possibilities we've realized and see the results. So that is where we have creativity. What do I do with this difference? As an artist, if I see, okay, there's a possibility that has not been realized yet, and I realize that, then this is innovation. Okay, so let's keep talking about the example of, of theater. So, for example, a theater, a drama, a playwright, processes such as creativity are produced by that drama director, for example, seeing a play, etc. Forgetting what I've seen, not understanding what I've seen. If I was an artist, I need to forget parts of what I've seen or make sure I forget about those things, productively not understand these things in order to be able to reach a point where I can formulate something new or something that I believe to be new. So not knowing or not remembering is part of human intelligence, while this is not part of machine intelligence, uh, AI. Can AI learn this? Well, right now, and as a non-computer scientist, I can't follow the entire discussions. Luciana Parisi, I think is her name, what she said about AI, if AI cannot integrate unpredictability and what they are producing in terms of deep learning neural networks, then there is no chance that this when, if when structure can be, if we can, if that they can go beyond this structure. But the longer we talk about how humans are different from machines, and the more we are able to describe what we 
can do on top, then the possibility becomes greater and greater that computer scientists are listening, eavesdropping basically, uh, and listening carefully to what we're describing in terms of actions, operations. As a sociologist, I think Niklas Luhmann dealt with this in his late works, is that, okay, we understand roughly what consciousness is about, we understand in how far that is embodied cognition, so it has something to do with our bodies. But what we don't understand is social intelligence. What I just described as structures of experience. So the capability to deal with the contingency of society as such, we are not able to understand that. But what does it mean not to understand something? And I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question, but it means that we take a look at an experience. I don't want to, to be pedagogical here, but not understanding means that you take an experience and refer from comparing it in an explanatory context. I fully can agree with Kant. Um, that, okay, here we have to talk about categories, creative forms of, of reading, of lecture are part of that. So saying I'm not interested in cultural theory, but I'll read Kant now. So that will give me the possibility to see things in a different light, understand things in a different light, in order to enable new contexts that can stem from anything, including personal awareness, which also played an important part for Kant. So maybe code specialists are among the audience today, tonight and can answer this question later. But I'll like to get back to one term that you mentioned as an important term before you t started talking about irritability in terms of evolution. We are at the point of synchronization. So how do these system references, and you said we should count to four or five and not only to one, you listed different system references that come into play. How is it possible that they function and can be combined without the paradigm of reason that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation where you referred to network society according to Hispanic states? So at the end of your presentation, you talked about synchronization as an effect where something is coming together. How is it coming together, I wonder? Does reason play no role at all? Or what forces ensure the success of the synchronization? This is the first part of the question. Then the second is maybe you can give us and share the examples that you did not share with us for uh, because you were running out of time. Well, reason is still part of it, but not as an integral of synchronization. Kant, and I think I've referred to him enough now, uh, he has the idea that reason is the subordinate capability, so the superior capability of the human being to deal with their surroundings. So sense, sensibility, um, sensual, the decency, so the potential for fascination and ex ex to be become exciting, be, be excited, going to school, school children, all of that. Heinz Bruder talked about as um, the representation of society as being indignant and so forth. So we see the society that is fascinated and excited by sensualities without anyone having any idea what kind of reason and rational, uh, rationality can actually control these phenomenons, phenomena. So sometimes there is an intelligent Respond, be response such as by Emmanuel Macron, who tries to travel his own country and talk to the uh, Gilets Jaunes to find out what they are concerned about. So to really grasp the emotion of the moment. 
so we are dealing with this society and in times of disaster we have to say this about modern society the society is no longer impressed by that whatever that means normative categories are not being lost but as a structural category that is part of electoral programs the understanding of what the market economy is about increasing prosperity well-being for example the idea of general school education so well educated people are more able to shape society than the less educated who, who actually said this right now the exact opposite is the case and is happening so we no longer believe in the semantic landscape I don't want to say that it's not going to come back um, I hope that this hope has that we have every reason to be hopeful but this landscape of media of enlightenment and I hope well I answered your question well maybe you can give us an example of the predict stability of this phenomena. I, I think you did talk about analogous computing, nervous systems, anything that is not about uh, is not part of artificial intelligence. Are there procedures for predicting successfulness? the 60-40 percentage of predictability, Amazon, whether it will be appreciated or not, at which level would this prognosis have to take place? What could happen at the analogous level? Or is artificial intelligence part of that? Well, I can only give you a very concrete answer to that. Well, please do. <laughs> uh, okay, I got this. Um, so the University of Wittenherdecke and Stuttgart uh, just had a very great um, doctoral candidate who looked at how the city of Munich used vectors to broker cars, parking space and bikes. So with a high level of mathematical imagination, this candidate developed was developing vectors that link users, resources, and space in the city. So everything that is part of a European, typical European city, a city center with a church, market square, what is part of our everyday conditions is being turned upside down. And the question is being asked, so where are bikes needed? Where are parking uh, spots needed? A rhythmic intelligence is part of that in the ability to predict, okay, who will be needing what bike where. So if you leave your bike where it will be needed next, then you will pay less rent than if you leave it in a place where nobody will need it. So there's a high level of design intelligence to reformulate the urban environment, reformat it, and generate different living conditions in a way. So that was one of the questions asked in the doctoral dissertation. Where does this lead us in terms of criticizing apps for urban infrastructure that are subsidized considerably by public authorities? Well, you do need streets. The app providers won't be building streets. Then bikes will be parked on bus lanes where the buses should be going, actually. so. Why are we not criticizing apps? And then part of this dissertation was the comment that they have their own form of criticism. It's a highly selective form of criticism because it, re it's, it comes from the, the, those, this group of people looking for a parking space. And this highly selective form of AI that is forced to, uh, com uh, to, to calculate these various aspects is what I refer to as synchronization against the backdrop of, of the time structure of uh, the physical, the mental, and the societal. We have our 
brains work extremely fast. We have a very slow consciousness and awareness, which is part of the solution of the problem, not part of the problem, by the way. And communication, and here we can, we all have different views, depending on the scene or the sphere of society that you're in. It's very fast in, 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 in financial markets, slow in politics, fast in certain forms of physical research, slow as far as I know in social sciences. So one of my favorite authors used one of my favorite terms, heterochronotopological order. It's such a beautiful term, heterochronotopological restructuring of the space using topi that have a heterogeneous uh, relationship. So synchronization is uh, what you are asking about. That's synchronization of the radical difference of time structures. And this whole refinement of something as harmless as a parking app is exactly part of that, those interfaces where we try to offer solutions. So this synchronization, as you call it, is happening among at least two forms of intelligence, human and artificial intelligence. I'd call it integration as a lay person. You call it synchronization in your works, in your terminology. So the question here is, is it fluid interfaces? You're also thinking about eras and era classification on the last pages of your book. You're using certain buzzwords for each era. It's it provides a great overview and it makes it a delight to browse through your book, which is unusual for sociological books. And what I wanted to ask is the following sociologist, and I don't want to be a nerd, but certain sociologists say it's dynamic because it can integrate criticism. And this is not a very new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that existed before the start of the digital age. And as a layperson, what you're describing in terms of synchronization and criticism, uh, for me, would be this form of classical uh, inter integration, which is something that capitalism has been doing successfully for a while. So how is this different from something that has been part of the system for 400 years roundabout? Just part of it. And what is a digital effect of the whole thing? Well, I learned uh, a lot from Botansky in this regard. First of all, it's important to say that modern society is uh, critical in itself. So we, we often said, well, you have to do, uh, do critis critis criticism from the outside. No, um, market economy is uh, criticism by companies and by um, customers. Even our love relationships are critical relationships by uh, the lovers and also by third parties who observe how love relationships fail. So we cannot move a cent cent uh, even an inch without uh, any criticism. Criticism is interesting action, it is our day-to-day -day thing. So when we uh, um so, uh, so often we, we are limited in our communication, but if we are assembled in a room like this and uh, uh, and when, when we talk about something, the only thing that you can up, come up with is criticism. And I listen to your criticism and think, well, that's not possible. And you listen to me and uh, the only thing that you think of is, no, 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 I don't believe him. No, at the beginning it's only um, questions regarding understanding. No. Well, I want to say, well, thank God, we are all very critical, and that is our normal way of life. The other, other thing is that, uh, well, this insight, and uh, uh, you, you see this with Boltansky and some of, and also in some of my essays, we have to take those seriously uh, and have a look at what kind of uh, possibilities for criticism, kind of uh, negation uh, is added by a machine, a machine intelligence. So will we have to expect machines to criticize us? Will Alexa tell us that we should have switched off the light and go to bed? Uh, will Alexa tell me, well, criticize me for reading uh, Kant again and will tell me to get out uh, Hegel from the bookshelves? And uh, so that is a different, a new and a much more comprehensive uh, 
kind of uh, intelligence and um, context that we move around. Christoph Kuglitz uh, once used the term of granular society, a society that um, um, uh, makes it possible to, um, to, 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 to have a close look at society uh, as such, quantify ourselves. So the, the, a lot of data is collected so we can um, see what makes us sick, what makes us uh, happy. Uh, so data communication, this has nothing to do with a critical enlightenment of modern society. A last question before we open uh, the discussion to the floor. You mentioned e the EU Commission as well, and we'll come back to that later. So a last question. When we assume that an analog, analogous computing is a kind of commute, computing that exerts control, that um, controls behavior, or that uh, controls artificial intelligences in a way that maybe we will not understand. So I think we've discussed that a couple of times already in this lecture series. When we have a look at a very day-to-day -day phenomena in so social media, so uh, compared to the explosion of uh, cities in Europe uh, in the 19th century, when a kind of um, uh, middle-class code developed uh, that uh, also uh, um, so it, it brought to some led to a lot of distance between people. So you cannot always ask uh, who is the person next to me because there were so many in those growing cities in the 19th century. Now I think we have a trend towards the opposite. In the social media, it's often about uh, where who we are, where we come from, what our position is, and is that uh, how would you describe that? Is that an an effect of a kind of artificial intelligence um, uh, resulting from the algorithms that are used by these social media, that social media now determine what we see, or is that our behavior that has already changed and uh, um, is controlled by analogous computing? Well, you cannot separate one from the other. And, and I mean, that uh, um, when we see these new forms of behavior, the, the, the term here is the individualization of the 19th century and uh, also during the 20th century. And we've, we are now growing into a kind of personalized society. The individualized society was a liberal society, a society with the enormous uh, um, civilization achievement, uh, namely that uh, every individual uh, sh should not be completely transparent. Uh, and in a liberal society, in the individualized society, you expect to be surprised. And that is considered to be important. Love relationships um, are relationships where if you're no longer surprised by your partner, then this basically means the end of your relationship unless you marry in, uh, in time. And uh, so the, the voter, the politician, the, com the entrepreneur, the customer, the teacher, the student are all um, examples of the unpredictability of what the other side does in the next moment. And our social, our intelligence consists in uh, in in making this and in, in um, in pricing this in, 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 in factoring this in, in our action, in our decisions. Personalization means that we are referred to as persons in these networks, whether it is professional networks or reputational networks or consumer networks where we depend on recommendations um, by others. Uh, Facebook is probably the worst example of that, where without um, f feeding these networks with our own personal information, we would then s suddenly notice that we would no longer exist in these networks. So we interrupt this uh, production of unpredictabilities unpredictab by offering uh, certain information, telling the networks, well, that is me, and this is the way that you can address me. So we establish identity structures that uh, 
subject us uh, to controls. So, but we also establish a certain identity structures that make it possible for us to control others. So I tell you who you who I am, so that you can decide whether you want to interact with me, and then I can decide as to whether these are the conditions uh, under which I want to interact with you. So it's often confused with re-tribalization, so uh, reinvention of a kind of social um, context and um, so, but this personalization undermines this uh, liberal achievements or these achievements of the previous era. They, so uh, that is the microphone that um, sends out a message can also listen. And so it goes uh, into both direction. I think there are, uh, there's one micro on the um, on, 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 on the upper floor here, and there's some microphones uh, down here. So um, you now have the possibility to ask questions. So the gentleman here in the third row. Well, yes. Thank you for uh, the lecture and for organizing all this. There were basically two things that. Um, confused me, irritated me. The first one has to do with the title, The Next Generation. So here you speak about one society, don't you? And only this one society that is being digitized or which digitizes uh, is referred to, I think. But I think there are also other societies that are not being digitized or that uh, do not use the digital media for for the reproduction of uh, their um, physical structure and uh, um, all these other um, structures. And my second question has is closely linked to that. What do you think about those societies? that have neither the printing press nor a written language nor digital media and still exist simultaneously so that they have a certain degree of complexity uh, and this complexity uh, makes it possible for these societies to continue to exist. Should they be part of this next generation? Should they be excluded? Should they be integrated? So what is your opinion? Well, thank you for this question. So I'm not able to set uh, norms and standards to decide who is allowed to be in and who not. So you are right. The singular, the next generation, that is always uh, dangerous, but it also brings about questions as to whether there are other societies as well. We, system theory, people who deal with systems theory, like to work with the singular, with the society, because so uh, so the, the the world society or the communication that we can observe on the earth. Can that all be subsumed under this title of the next generation? I would say yes, certainly. Uh, because in this brings into the second question, because uh, this uh, we are confronted with the 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 the, the, the phenomenon of um, uh, not simultaneousness, uh, namely societies that jump from the um, oral uh, age directly into the digital age. Uh, um, sometimes we learn from those societies. I don't want to name them here uh, because uh, you have to be cautious in this regard. Sometimes we learn more from these societies than we can teach them, actually. The backdrop to this question is that uh, what uh, was called modernization research in sociology until the 1960s, um, the idea, idea at that time was that uh, societies uh, would uh, inevitably undergo certain stages of modernization. Well, that is rubbish. Uh, for example, in the Amazon air area, we have every reason to say, yes, we want to have certain reserve, reserves there that nobody uh, will go there by helicopter. There will, no, will not be any doctors. Maybe you read the article in the couple, in the couple of last few days. There were two tribes, uh, uh, Indian tribes, uh, when they started uh, to wage war against each other. 
other than um, police officers or the military were sent in. And despite all um, the other um, 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 considerations, yes, you're right. Uh, the singular is dangerous, but I've, I'm also right. The singular, namely the article, the is is also productive, and we also have this um, uh, unsimultaneousness of uh, these uh, different uh, uh, um, media. So there are great essays on how um, uh, smartphones are used differently in different societies or different cultures. So, um, so for example which uh, pictures are favored. So there are societies that love cat pictures, but there are also, um, um, also Asian societies where people take hundreds of pictures with feet on the table. So the question is, why? Is, is there a virus behind that? That uh, there's something that people think this is funny and this uh, spreads and and uh, so, so uh, let us um, focus our attention on such phenomena and uh, not uh, uh, and let us um, not believe that uh, with the use of digital media all all the uh, cultures in the world will behave in the same way so there's uh, Albert Reinhardt is my name and I don't know where to start, really. I think that we are facing the problem of somebody wanting to build their home when they buy the premises, the estate, they think of the brave new world, and we're thinking of the brave new world of digitalization, but we're not thinking about the cultural foundations that are already there make it impossible for us to reach that. What I mean is that we still ask the young generations and require them to conform, to adapt, to be subordinate because we used to send them to, into wars and that is why we constructed the school system in the way it still is today. But for the new system, we need young people who can come up in a creative way with their own future in order to embody the community by having an effect in their behavior on society. And politics use harsh words um, and images. So, so as with the Gotthard Tunnel, you need to drill from both sides. But the young people have, we have to open up the system for the young people to be able to use this phase where they try to find themselves to have a greater effect on, on their own future and on their future problems. At the same time, it's about cultural foundation. So this we society, what's where is it anchored? It used to be a higher force that bound us together, but in 20 years' time, this will no longer be the case. So we are overtaxing the individual by tasking them with having to explain the world to themselves every day again from scratch. And I'll finish in a moment, but this has to do with us drawing up this we all the time through communication. They become the terms of reference that are being agreed. So these rules of dialogue, that's part of our genes. It's, that's because we're humans. And if we just forget about that, then uh, beware Luhmann. So we won't have an answer to these questions anymore. Well, thank you. I don't believe in this we. I, I don't know who that should be. I'd use you instead. Because when I'm giving my presentation here, you are my audience, and I try to do something that lives up to this good venue and this audience. When I'm at home, the situation is different again. So my question, 
how does this form a community? I, I think we can't answer that question. What I think is way more interesting, this is something that was a subtext in your comment just now, you alluded to it, is that task of the current society, and I'm using the singular here, to create possibilities for the co-evolution of societies in various areas, society, um, body, etc. So looking at the past decades of automation, computer, the success of computers, all that we know is that there was a lot of resistance. My favorite anecdote here is that hospitals that it took hospitals 40 years for computers to move from the basement to really the bedside of patients. It took 40 years for patients, physicians, nurses, carers, and of course it took new forms of technical support systems, etc., to really work with this medium, this new medium. And the medium of revolution is about the capability to start using something despite resistance and in a form that was not planned originally. So this part, this process of evolution is what I believe in and hope for. And I also be careful talking about the Gotthard Tunnel because there's sand in the middle of it. I know that because I'm from that region and if you're d drilling from both sides, that would be dangerous. As well, I think everybody does understand English. If not, we will translate it shortly. There's a question right in the middle down here, and there's one up there, and then we'll have a look on Twitter. Bitte. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich, uh, well, thank you very much. I'll be speaking in German. Thank you for not giving a TED Talk. My name is Isabella Hermann. I'm coordinating a working group on AI at BDIA. And you said that 40% where Amazon is wrong, that this is maybe the area or the degree of freedom. And if I understood that correctly, this is the sphere where no data is collected that are free spheres. So my question here is, is that not the spheres that take freedom from me. Marion Foucault said in the same series of events, visibility is a trap and invisibility is a trap also. So my question to you, how do you, f do you, do you define this? When am I part of, society, of a society and what does that mean for my data? Well, that's a good question, which is also too difficult for me to answer. Uh, of course, it's important to say where do these 40% of unpredictability come from? What is astonishing here is that it is enough to be able to, to, to know what we did before and who we are in co contact with to use these 40% to predict what will be happen next. And this is what I talked about when I talked about strategic, um, statistical, excuse me, predictability. I would not equate this with freedom. It's about scope for behavior. Pedro Dominguez used one of my favorite sentences, and he wrote a very readable book about machine learning. Pedro Dominguez said in his in the final chapter that we don't need to choose between visibility and invisibility, but about withdrawing from the system, which is not possible. The systems that register our presence through click streams or to train algorithms. So when you're on Amazon buying books, and I'm not asking you to do so, but then it makes a lot of sense to, to look for books you're interested in with one account and look for presents for your ne nephews and nieces using a different account because the algorithm won't be able to differentiate between the two. Or it had not been able to do that for a long time. So the recommendations, somebody is shaking their, not, uh, their heads over there, were not usable. Train your algorithms, that's been the message 
for a long time and for many consumers and occupations you could do that. I did not follow this recommendation and I admit I don't buy books on Amazon a lot, but it's an interesting choice. It's a choice we could really be thinking about instead of asking the question all the time, how can we avoid this and that? There was one question up there. I'm sorry, I did not see you before. That was because of the light. Christian Engelmann is my name. Uh, where is he? Ah, over there, okay. So I'd like to know, you said at the beginning that the next society will move away, away from functional differentiation to network society. If I remember correctly, for Luhmann, functional differentiation means that there are individual systems where differences are observed. So, for example, power, lack of power in politics, having not having in um, the economy. So, how will these differences be different in a network society? Thank you very much. I'd like to know that too. I'm a Botansky fan in this context because he wrote this excellent book. Uh, large Juger, I think, is the title in French. He published it in 1991, back then already. And uh, the French are very skeptical about systems theory, I must say. But in this, this book, Botansky, fully bought into the concept of functional differentiation by not saying it's systems theory, but value spheres. You could call them discourses, too. And this is a huge research program. I wouldn't know which institute to involve, but it would be a huge research initiative if we wanted to see at which points are what networks and what are networks uh, part of these value spheres. My theory is that value that these uh, systems are being reduced to value spheres, which allow us to recognize things. We're still able to say, okay, we understand society. Uh, we can differentiate between love and economy, for example, which can come in handy. But bottom line of this theory could be that describing Network X, a mafia network, a working group, Germany, brotherhoods at, at universities, protest movements, he, communities, you could say, only those networks are um, able and compatible with network societies that are part of all value spheres. Luhmann at some point discontinued this theory, but said at some point that systems were specific to certain functions, hospitals, schools, all of that. Today, you could say, and I'd like to test this hypothesis really, a network that is not politically compatible, that is not able to mobilize economic resources, that does not have a pedagogical element in training its staff, that does not have a certain aesthetic in becoming recognizable, that does not have a religious or ideological component, will not be able to survive. Of course, you can say there are networks that are part of all value spheres, reference to mass media, for example. They appear and disappear again. Others are in a good position, all those value spheres, and are able to survive much longer and develop over a much longer time sphere, time period. So yes, I'd like to work in that direction if I had the time resources. Well, isn't it great if you can <laughs> come up with your idea for the next book here? Well, I don't know whether a book is a good resource, but well, let's have a look at what's happening on Twitter. 
my colleagues are over there. They need a microphone. So we have a question from the Twitter community, which uh, community which refers to the statement about the inclusion concept of modernity that is being replaced by uh, the observation of a network society that no longer has anything to do with that strategically, stru structurally. Digitalization is no longer inclusive per se. What's the reason for this? Open source Wikipedia show the exact opposite. Great question. It's not down to digitalization, but networks. Digitalization is a resource of digital media that can be used anytime, anywhere. That is highly inclusive. Everybody can get involved. The trick is that the extreme requirement to adapt software and hardware depends on what group of people is dealing with what technology. The hypothesis that is that there will only that only those systems will survive that somehow manage to selectively use electronic media to have connections to all of the global society. Those networks are selective because the hardware and software they are using relies on selective connections. Open source makes all of that possible, but it does not mean that these uh, possibilities then can then be used anywhere, anytime, and are open to everyone. Another comment or question on Twitter? No? Okay, so let's have a look at the time. Okay, we are almost running out of time. I have a final question, but I'd now like to hear, to see whether there are other questions from the audience, if there are any. A question? Yes, over there. Well, thank you. So you successfully irritated me as well. And uh, I have a question regarding this irritation or irri so has AI moved away from, uh, um, so we, we, we discover the statistical um, competence of uh, human beings, um, that is what you said. Uh, and uh, well, I have several questions, so please, just one question. So a question regarding the narrative uh, that is prevailing uh, as a result of digitization. We look uh, at it uh, through a lens, we use certain words uh, to describe certain action, and so the statistical intelligence. So to what extent do we limit ourselves when we look through such a lens, with such a narrative, also with regard to planability and um, the possibility to measure certain things so with the apps that you mentioned, that everything becomes probable or improbable, so that the probability is calculated. To what extent do we limit ourselves as a result of that? And to what extent does it uh, um, become impossible, impossible for us to have certain experiences or work towards experiences if we look at everything through this narrative? So we limit ourselves ourselves to exactly to those things that are possible. So this is a max, maximum limitation. And uh, what we then see is what is possible. And these uh, uh, statistics with Shannon, they are the basis for the description of an information theory that I believe can also be used to sociology. Uh, the, the, the basis for that is that within this lens, you ex you see what you exclude and you see what you include. So you can at any time focus on what you think is interesting and exit the whole thing and draw your attention to what is more of more interest to you. So, uh, yes, that is something that exists. Uh, these uh, uh, um, um, ways of thinking that include what you exclude. 
Uh, namely, so this means that you can you you have no outside basically, but that is not really an answer to your question. Uh, so obviously, you have an idea of. Uh, um, becoming poorer through these um, statistics, and that is an idea that I don't share. So at the end, I want to um, refer to European um, level, if uh, that exists. And there's a quote from the uh, from from your book, uh, 4.0. So the quote is: uh, poli po "Politics is no longer." Um, um, the what is special, but let's decide. So the okay. So, politics is no longer that one can impose a state of emergency, but it is a digital platform, uh, which is the backbone of our network. Uh, so, um, the threat. So, is do you see a possibility of politi politics to um, to reduce this monopoly? Um, so the. I think it is sufficient <coughs> if uh, we say that uh, networks are uh, attractive and they don't even have to be a monopoly. It's just, it's it is sufficient if people consider these networks to be, or these platforms uh, to be attractive. And uh, um, um, so that is how the EU Commission is, uh, uh, is positioning itself in a very impressive way. They say that in uh, that moment, as, uh, as soon as these platforms are cemented, uh, there is no possibility for alternatives to come up to, to be developed um, because these um, this theory of uh, power laws the com competitor wouldn't stand a chance and the resources uh, um, um, and that therefore the uh, it is at the level of resources which one has to become active and I think um, there's no reason to, with this enormous amount of deregulation that we have to 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 to, 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 to interfere uh, with this. There's no law in the world that. Uh, that uh, would um, uh, say that, uh, um, that artificial in intelligence and digitalization is a superior force that uh, politics has to subject itself to. Um, so well, thank you very much, Dirk Becker, and we'll continue in June with Josef von Dijk uh, in a different venue. Um, so you will get a little present uh, for, for your uh, participation here, and I would like to thank the audience for being for staying with us for these two hours. Thank you.